So thank you, Elga. Thank you, everybody. And as they say now in France, bonjour à tous. To speak about La Rouche is to speak about the solution and the future because of what he has done and is doing. I am very honored to tell you about it. I'm a bit tense because here he is, here is his wife, and here is Holly. So, la pensée de La Rouche s'inscrit dans le devenir. La Rouche thinking proceeds from the becoming as a science which is the active principle of the economy. Le système financier transatlantique, and I proceed in French, le système financier transatlantique, the transatlantic financial system in which we are living, based on accumulation of money, is leading to the opposite, not to the science of physical economy, but to chaos and war, or more precisely and more tragically, to a combination of both. The preceding speakers have shown that the current world is more dangerous, yes, more dangerous than it ever was during the hates of the Cold War. The system by its very nature is criminogenic. It is a criminogenic world. Justice has become a cash convertible commodity while fraudsters operate in packs and frauds are committed on a systemic scale which in turn turn our stock markets into giant crime scenes. Too big to, too big to fail, fail, too big to manage, too big to jail. An industry of unpunished corruption has become the norm and made the presidents of our central banks counterfeiters. The mere fines that financial criminals have slapped on them, in effect, give them the right to perpetuate their fraud and trafficking, and they pay it with the bank's reserves to the detriment of employees, depositors, and even shareholders. Today, these mega banks bluntly admit, as JP Morgan Chase did in its analysis published on May 28, 2013, the euro area adjustments about halfway there, their intention is to dissolve the democratic systems in order to enforce increasingly ferocious austerity measures on unwilling people. What Lionel LaRouche forecast would happen back in the 1970s, is now being echoed after it did happen by all those who are preoccupied with the future of mankind. As the criminals are operating in broad daylight while fictitious capital comprised of debts and financial assets is growing at the expense of the creation of wealth in the real economy. However, contrary to analysis that enjoy, analysts that enjoy doom and gloom or practice selective indignation, the Rouge from the start reacted against this state of affairs by drafting alternative policies. He didn't just denounce policies that were becoming increasingly intolerable and leading to war by their inner logic of looting and, once again, by their eastward quest of Lebensraum, but he proposed, one after the other, win-win projects on a world scale, a productive triangle between Paris, Berlin and Vienna after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a Eurasian land bridge with and with Helga, his wife, a new Silk Road and a new world land bridge for peace and mutual development. LaRouche, without hesitation, said no and then defined another frontier, giving us a future. When I first became aware of his ideas, over already more than 40 years ago, three things struck me immediately. First, the fact that his concept of economics was not derived from statistics and currencies, but from the creative powers of the human mind. 
As in Edgar Allan Poe's purloined letter, this fact escapes our perception, although its reality is blinding. As a thinker inspired by the American revolutionary tradition and as a critical reader of Marx, LaRouche revolted against the Malthusian vision of the Club of Rome. The latter <coughs> the latter sharing with financial capitalism the method of linear extrapolation of existing resources without taking into account those the human mind is capable of discovering. Unique about LaRouche is that he builds into his first move of rejection the foundation of a required alternative. To criticize without proposing, he often argues, only leads to pessimism or even worse, to destructive violence. To criticize the dominant order without presenting an alternative only leads to hateful nihilism, which led to the terrible ravages in the 20th century or again today in Europe, which is becoming xenophobic and communitarian. LaRouche's approach goes beyond deduction and induction, based on an unwavering determination to change the social environment, to make it worthy of mankind, and to do so with what I call in French a universal empathy, which leads him to always say aloud what he conceives. He defines himself he defines himself and acts as a human being living in the future and is inspired by those that in the past have allowed us to escape from dead ends by their capacity to discover realities beyond the egoistical sphere of sense perception. It is the quality of agape which distinguishes human beings from all other species known so far. The second thing which struck me is his, in his thinking is that he understood how so-called liberal ideology has by definition no directionality and therefore allows, allows all transgressions. LaRouche immediately understood that the moral deregulation produced by Woodstock and May 68 would lead one decade later to financial deregulation and the mutually assured greed that generates crime. He demonstrated also the destructive consequences of the August 1971 decoupling of gold from the dollar, an agreement that offered the world like a chicken coop without protection to the foxes of finance and Margaret Thatcher's October 20. 27, 1986, Big Bang, opening of the city of London to the wildest financial speculation of the entire world's financial entities. Then, in 1999, LaRouche denounced the scrapping of Franklin Roosevelt Glass-Steagall Act, not as a technical measure, but as a license to loot given to the major financial institutions in the jungle they had created this way, which rendered entire nations impotent to defend their people. At the same time, and this is a supplementary proof of his originality, LaRouche warned that unbridled economic liberalism, akin to the one that went rampant during the 30s, leads to fascist takeovers, as now openly admitted by J.P. Morgan Chase report. I remember LaRouche telling us that the economic liberals and financial libertarians are like drunkards. They fill themselves up with financial assets, have a hangover during the weekend, and wake up as fascists on Monday morning. On September 2, 1971, during a debate with Keynesian economist Abel Lerner, popular at the times at Queen's College, New York, LaRouche brought Lerner to say that if the world had supported the policy of Yalma Schacht, Hitler and his wars and concentration camps would have been avoided. Note that Schacht was Hitler's finance minister and the financial wizard who organized his rise to power and imposed austerity and financial manipulation with the full backing of the city and Wall Street. In 1971, Lerner promoted this liberal authoritarian policy for the Brazilian military dictatorship a policy adopted a policy adopted two years later by Pinochet and the Argentine generals, which led to their atrocities. 
Since then, 1971, U.S. journalists were ordered to stop mentioning LaRouche, and if ever obliged to do so, to slander him and pervert his message. This only comes as a surprise for those who never consulted the U.S. and British press between 1930 and 1938. In 1989, after a political trial, recognized as a total frame-up by those who looked into the matter, including by goalists of the French resistance, LaRouche was sentenced to five years in prison, which he left even more determined to fight. The third thing which appeared to me is LaRouche's capacity to see the world as a whole in a permanent state of becoming. As an American patriot, he always sought, as far as to China, as the Muslims would say, what other patriots have contributed to the world, and he fought for a dialogue of cultures and civilizations. The creative capacities of human beings have their roots in the works of classical culture, classical in the sense that it attempts to awaken in each human being the best he or she has to inspire his spirit of discovery with art and science advancing with the same pace. Hence the importance, as LaRouche stresses, of Einstein, who starts from what he calls a Gedanken Experiment, a thought experience in the physical universe which he nourished by his daily practice of playing the violin in the company of Mozart and Beethoven. On the opposite end stands Bertrand Russell, the, the philosopher of the British Empire, while the who starts from the mathematical principles in a universe composed of axioms and postulates from which he derives subsequently in the smallest possible number the logical properties. Einstein said, although I am a typical loner in my daily life, my awareness of belonging to the invisible community of those who strive for truth, beauty and justice prevents me from feeling lonely. That same awareness is what always inspired LaRouche, who never be who never become discouraged, not even in prison, because of his personal commitment. This awareness also led him to fight Russell's ideology, a destructive stamp our society still bears, the, ide the ideology of an empire managing the logic of a finite world that excludes progress and demands that the less prolific races will have to defend themselves against the more prolific by methods which are disgusting even if they are necessary, quote from Russell in 1923. Consider everything LaRouche is fighting against today, from the now criminal provocations of NATO to the depopulation policies. We are faced with the implacable coherence of a culture of death, and we need to defeat its logic in the world, is to have a future. At the basis of evil, there is this conception of a finite world created once and forever and where the technology deployed by human beings does not serve to improve the living conditions for all, but to oppress them and, in fine, to destroy them. LaRouche's method of physical economy has to be first of all defined as in opposition to a universe that is running down incapable of producing the necessary resources to allow a world population the conditions of the future. Those proclaiming themselves realists and reasonable while following the rules of the game of the system in reality contribute to, the, to its collapse by the mere fact that they operate inside the system without fighting it. Now we have arrived at a point in history where a system, systemic change, a just concept of economy and man are necessary for the survival of all. Money has no intrinsic value. It is nothing but an instrument acquiring value through what it promotes. From there on, what is the goal to reach? LaRouche defines that the objective of an economic policy worth the name is to create the most favorable conditions possible for the development of the creative powers of individuals operating in a society organized to do so, health, education, research and development, 
and so on. The key economic criteria is not to buy cheap and sell expensive or to acquire rare goods which others can buy, but to increase what LaRouche calls the potential population density relative to the society. It is, and this is what means relative here, the carrying capacity of a given society and its economy made possible by the constant introduction of new technologies applying the discoveries of new physical principles. The Russian, the link between science and its scientific applications. The Russian scientist and space expert Bobich Kutnetsov called this fundamental criterion the L, L for LaRouche. Hence, physical economy, as opposed to monetarist economy, which makes money a value in itself, aims to increase this L, the transformational power as a function of the potential physical development of society per capita, per surface unit, and per household. The issue is not to maximize till the limit a given technology at a given moment, since that produces a progressive decrease of energy, but to overcome this loss by the introduction of new modes of production. This means more free energy relative to that required to maintain the system. Both in terms of energy and technology, the challenge is to increase the flux of energy density produced per capita per surface and per weight unit of materials employed. This defines, for example, the relative superiority of nuclear power as compared to other modes of energy production <coughs> and its inferiority if one remains at the level of nuclear fission obtained from pressured water reactors as those designed by Westinghouse in the 60s. Progress is defined by the transition from increasingly productive nuclear vessel designs, fourth generation nuclear fission, to thermonuclear fusion. As such, nuclear energy is not a technical method at a given moment, but a dynamic carried and elevated by human creation. The physical constraints which will carry nuclear energy beyond current methods are the challenge of space travel, where fusion will be key and much later matter-antimatter reactions. So are we daydreaming? No, since these things exist in a universe in constant creation, and the increasingly advanced command over these principles cannot be based on a cooperation of the different parts of humanity united by a common aim. We talked about uh, unipolar and multipolar. There's, there's one aim which transcends everything. In short, this signifies peace through mutual economic development, not so much by the goal to reach, but by the necessary mobilization to reach it and the quality of development of those being part of it. Lyndon LaRouche has always insisted on the quality of cooperative labor as key to the success of this method. A method is a word I don't like and which in French seems formal and even formalin and to which I prefer the one of spirit of discovery which makes economics the most beautiful of all sciences since requiring its constant application. Just imagine, and some of you here might have seen them, children and adolescents rediscovering and experimenting new physical principles at the opposite of the Burton Russell's method. And in this case, it's definitely a method that one of the discourse on method of René Descartes where with this method, where children learn and rediscover, like Einstein's, constructions in the physical economy. It is here among these children and adolescents that starts physical economy in service of that which is human and man, as envisioned by LaRouche. What source will irrigate this economy? For LaRouche, essentially, this comes ne neither from rent nor taxes based on what exists in monetary terms, but rather on the anticipation of the creation that will be made possible by productive credit. While the Anglo-Dutch system defines itself, let's repeat it, by possession and monetary emissions and by the control of a financial oligarchy of central banks on states, the American system 
of LaRouche express itself by productive credit. It is by the power given to a country to emit credit for great projects aimed to increase the L and the energy density flux of energy and technology. That's the conception of Alexander Hamilton, the founder of the American system of political economy, shared who shared that view which very little known in Europe. Hamilton introduced Article 1, Section 8 into the U.S. Constitution, which gives power to the U.S. Congress to emit letters of credit on the federal government in favor of the public treasury, which in turn calls on the National Bank to coordinate the allocation of these credits. This concept of public credit redefines which conception which doesn't exist in Europe, redefines the very nature of debt, the intention by the government to pursue an action it deems necessary and to get into debt for its realization. Debt there is, is but without money circulating in the process, credit money being nothing but a tool by which state credit is transformed but without being liquidity. Hence, the syst this system of public credit defines value as a means to increase the productive powers of labor, as said above, per capita, per surface unit, and per unit of materials employed. It's clearly the physical economy in service of human beings that will allow the, the tangible goods resulting from the income generated by the project itself to pay back the debt. Money has only a value. Money has only a value if it is connected to credit emission. In that sense, one can speak of an anti-usury system. Abraham Lincoln said, man is not the only animal who labors, but he is the only one who improves his workmanship. It is on that improvement and not on monetary speculations or hopes for financial profit that the Hamiltonian system is based, a system extended and made more perfect by Lionel LaRouche. This approach is at the antipodes of what prevails in the United States today and Europe since the suppression of national banks and the public credit system. In the United States, it is by perverting the Constitution that the economy has was handed over to the mega banks and Wall Street. In Europe, it was the destructive evolution of the European Union which made nations credit dependent on the same mega banks through the European Central Banks. The result is what we have defined at the beginning of this presentation, the financial looting and the world akin to the 1930s drifting towards war if nothing is done to stop it. LaRouche's approach has been partly adopted by the creation as set this morning by the creation of the Eurasian Economic Union and the One Belt, One Road Chinese project for the new Silk Road with their, its credit institution, such as the BRICS New Development Bank, a bank whose capital has been doubled recently and whose contracts will be signed in the currencies of the member states rather than dollars or in euros. It is, a, it is there that lies hope. It doesn't lie in our transatlantic world that runs into a wall, except if we mobilize to change it. Let's exit the world context of before. Let's fight for the world after. Let's imagine teams of scientists, of engineers, of qualified technicians and workers combining their skills and know-how on the scale of Eurasia and of the world, and given the means to exert and permanently expand their capabilities. Imagine them sparking a new spirit of co-development and win-win partnership, the method of physical economy of Lyndon LaRouche. Imagine the United States and ourselves, Europeans, rediscovering our sense of mission and our constitutional principles. Isn't that what the Ode to Joy, which became banal, is all about? Let's take it back from those who have falsified the European Union to build a real Europe of projects and fatherlands and beyond an entente, a détente and a cooperation between the countries of the entire world. It is by such type of project and by what it inspires that we can re-establish in each of us the required self-esteem to finish off the dominant predatory system. 
the challenge of LaRouche is to put into action in the 21st century all the means of the physical economy in service of mankind to build peace through mutual development that were mobilized in a financially imperial and ideologically Russellite 20th century for war. Physical economy can become the most beautiful of all sciences since it produces and transmits the good. It is the science of the human mind. LaRue shows us the road to hope. It will not be paved with roses, but the road of combat. Hence, such is our conviction, man can and has to become the artist of the universe by exploring domains that are unknown but can be mastered since the inborn principle of creation exists inside us. Therefore, let us create, let us create for the generations yet unborn, let's create for peace by, through mutual development, that's the principle and the common salvation for humanity. That's the mission and that's our nature. Let's then not stop failing, because failing is not human and failing is not LaRouchian. Thank you.